Um, well, hello everyone. Um, we have quite a busy program, as you can see. All of you should have had a program, uh, have a program on your seats. Um, so we've got a lot to get through. And as for those of you who have been here before and know me, know that I tend to rabble, rabble on a little bit. Um, so I'm going to try and be very quick. So I have to do some basic welcomes. We're very excited about tonight. Um, there's a number of partners involved uh, tonight. Um, one of the things, one of the reasons, and you'll hear a little bit from uh, our, our next kind of welcomer, uh, Jeff Isaacson from USRA, about why maybe perhaps how this got came together. Um, but the partnership with the University Space Research Association, the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation and Rice Space Institute, um, this all sort of came about just from suggesting that we should do something at Rice. And we've been really lucky um, with the people that we have here tonight. I think you'll, you'll agree having seen the program. And I'm, I'm really excited about, um, uh, about tonight's events. And I hope you can stay for uh, the length of it. We have a reception uh, networking session right at the end. Um, one thing I did have control over is sort of when we had it. And for those of you who know, uh, this is September 12th. And uh, 57 years ago today, there was a very famous speech in the stadium not too far away, in a galaxy not too far away from us. Um, and I think we'll hear about a slightly different stadium for a different purpose from a couple of people a little bit later. So I'm not going to say any more than that. Um, before we get started, apart from recognize, I always like to recognize the audience. You guys have been really supportive of our events here, so I appreciate you coming out again. Um, and I do have uh, some, we have some representatives and representative staffers here tonight. So I'd like to recognize State Representative Dennis Paul, uh, who apparently, um, Nathan, is not here. I need, I need the nod. He's working. Um, so I saw, uh, well, there's a bunch of people who haven't made it here. Apparently traffic's pretty bad. Anyway, we're expecting State Representative Dennis Paul and his wife. Uh, Jay Guerrero um, is here somewhere. I know he's here. Jay, thank you. He's the regional director for Senator John Cornyn. I think, I think Jason Fuller is also here. Jason, good to see you. He's the regional director for Senator Ted Cruz. And we have Jared, uh, Jared Borges, who's here who's uh, from uh, Congressman Randy Weber, that's the Texas 14th. So thank you for being here. Um, we expect you all to be supporting the space program um, and, your, and your bosses, so thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the Baker Institute for hosting. We don't often get to have our events over here, so this is really good, and the, the staff they have here supporting us is are really great. Uh, personally, I'd like to thank uh, Carolina Avendaniel, who is milling around making this happen. And uh, Pamela Jones, who's not here, but she's in the Dean's office who helps us with the, with the mailings and all that stuff. In particular, I'd like to thank Ginny Whitaker, who is probably still working and not sitting. Oh, there they are. Oh, sorry, right over here. Um, it takes quite a lot to put all this together when you've got requests from our government relations people and you've got requests from all sorts of places. And then if, particularly if you're working with NASA headquarters. And uh, um, so Jenny's put uh, a lot of work in to make this happen. So uh, I'm sure it's going to be a great success. And it all goes down to the work that these folks have done. And then Macy Stewart and the, the folks here at the Baker Institute. Now, this is where I get to thank our sponsor. I just called him up and thanked him personally on the phone because apparently he's stuck in traffic. Arturo Machuca, who some of you know. So our events here at the Space Institute are sponsored by the Houston Airport System via the Houston Spaceport. Um, Houston Spaceport is at Ellington Field, so you can imagine why he's late, because he runs an airport. Um, and one of the things I wanted to tell you about Arturo, um, he just had a DNA test recently, and apparently he's 1% Scottish. So there's even more reason, <laughs> there's even more reason to, to like him than, we, than the reasons we have already. Um, so with that, um, to get the program moving, I'd like to invite Jeff Isaacson up, uh, he's the president of the USRA, to say a few words to get us moving. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you, David. It's so great to be here. When USRA was founded 50 years ago, the express purpose was to foster collaboration uh, among universities, governments, uh, and other organizations. And that purpose remains true today. So as you might expect, uh, when the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation contacted us about trying to foster a collaboration on a series of moonshot symposia, we were you know, very certainly uh, eager uh, to take part in that. Now, sometimes fostering collaboration is uh, really hard work, but I have to admit to all of you that for us this time around, it, it wasn't. So I would really like to thank the people that you know, really had much more to do 
uh, with making this event uh, come off. Uh, first, uh, Rice University and the Baker Institute and the Rice Space Institute uh, for hosting, and especially David Alexander for doing most of the heavy lifting uh, in your leadership, and we really appreciate that. And also uh, the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation and Stephen Rothstein for um, suggesting the original idea uh, for the symposium. Now, as David said, today is an historic day. And in 1962, on September 12th, President Kennedy made his now famous speech about space exploration. So this Saturday, I would ask all of you to please remember that Rice Place, Texas, not because it is easy, <laughs> but because it is hard. And as 32-point underdogs, Las Vegas agrees. So let's prove them wrong. Uh, thank you all, and good luck with that. So next, we're going to have a few short words and a little uh, video presentation uh, from Stephen Rothstein, um, who is from the John F. Kennedy uh, Library Foundation. Um, they do a lot of great stuff in there. I think you're about to see some of that. And again, I'd like to join Jeff in thanking them for the original idea and actually thinking about Rice um, and hosting this event here. So thanks again, Stephen. Thanks to you. To you, everyone at Rice, Jeff and your team, NASA, Doug, each and every one of you for being here. Uh, to say, my name is Steve Rothstein. I'm the executive director of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. In most of the events this year, I've started off in spending time talking about what President Kennedy said at Rice. Because we're at Rice and because Doug Brinkley's here, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to instead um, just spend um, two minutes have you watch a video. President Kennedy inspired us, and I'll say to the legislators and legislative staff in the room, he inspired a bipartisan group of legislators to invest in this amazing commitment of, and the 400,000 people that worked on it. And so we thought this year, how do we inspire the next generation to be excited? And so we use the, the most current technology, augmented reality. And so you're going to see the launch of Apollo, the augmented reality version of Apollo 11 that's available on your phone. So Kevin, I think if you could tee that up and show everybody. Good morning and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library. We're here in Boston, Massachusetts today to celebrate a very special event. 50 years ago today, the Apollo 11 mission was on the launch pad. The Saturn V rocket carrying the first humans to touch the moon was ready to go. And it really was um, about inspiration, wasn't it? Was, it was, It was about one man's vision for what could happen and then pulling it all together. John F. Kennedy gave this speech and had this idea, and it was sort of this thing, this seemingly impossible task that we were attempting to accomplish. They didn't think this was going to work. They didn't know that this was possible. And maybe it made other people think, well, if they can do that, what can I do? Absolutely. Right? And then maybe that's, that's what it's all about. That's what it was about 50 years ago, and that's what it's about here today. It was a moonshot. Absolutely. And today we're going to do it again, except through augmented reality. So we've actually got the full scale length of the rocket in front of us, and you can play all kinds of different games. We also have a really special guest with us today. We've got Dr. Lupo. He is a big deal. Kind of a big deal, honestly, yes. yeah. You said you wanted to be an astronaut when you were a kid. My dream job, you know, we all have, yeah, a lot of people want to be veterinarians and doctors and stuff like that. I wanted to go to space, NASA. I called you an astronaut. Let's do it. Are you allowed that? Like, is Call that okay? Me. It's a once in a lifetime experience and to be able to recreate it, it's pretty magical. Let's do this. We're gonna get the countdown, all the phones up in the air. There's 10, nine, nine eight, eight Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. There it goes. The Saturn V rocket straining against the bow of humanity. This is people coming together, what we can accomplish whenever we work as one. This was amazing. This was beyond what I ever could have expected to feel it. To see it, it's just amazing to be here at the JFK Library. It's that much more special. Thank you. So I think that's downloadable now, right? We can you know, access that, so that should be a lot of fun. Um, it's quite daunting to uh, introduce, uh, actually, our next two speakers, um, and then I have to go into the panels who are full of really daunting people too. Um, 
Doug Brinkley, uh, I bump into him occasionally at Rice, but he's more often found in the CNN studios uh, commenting on various things, so he's a very hard man to get a hold of. Um, and so I was very, very honoured, and uh, I actually feel quite lucky that we were able to get a hold of him, and I think it's partly because of his wife answers the email. So otherwise, otherwise I don't think we'd have him here. And, um, you know, I think uh, what, one of the things we're going to do too, if you haven't seen already, is... Um, one of the things that's doing really well right now and is, is gathering a lot of attention is his new book about the American moonshot, and we're going to hear some of that. Um, there will be a book signing uh, during the reception um, at the very end of, of this, this kind of uh, uh, long evening. Um, if my eyes will hold up, I, I can say a little bit about Doug. Um, so we're very proud because he's a Rice professor, which um, we always regard as a fairly, fairly good honour to have, regardless of any other accomplishments, and it will help if we win on Saturday. Um, <laughs> he's the, the, the Catherine Sanoff Brown Chair in Humanities and Professor of History at Rice University, CNN pre uh, Presidential Historian, and a contrib contributing editor at Vanity Fair. Um, he's on many boards and museums and colleges and his historical societies. And the Chicago Tribune uh, dubbed him America's new past master, which is a kind of nice play on words there. Um, so there's lots of, again, lots of things that we can, we can talk about. But I think the, the main thing is he's pretty much regarded um, as one of the eminent historians in the country. Um, one of the best writers in the country um, and one of the best commentators in the country. And again, we're very lucky that not only is he at Rice, but a lot of the things he's focused on has been on things that have impacted Rice over the years. And um, again, I could say many, many more things, um, but I think he's the man who's best to say it for himself. And so if you would join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Doug Brinkley, up to the floor. Good evening, and thank you for showing up tonight. We have a competing Democratic um, debate going on, but we got a full house here, which is a good thing. And I'm, I have to say, I'm just honored to be on the same panel as a NASA administrator. Jim, thank you for being here. Back to Rice, your school, and um, I'm, I'm honored to be on the program with you. And also, in the front row, George Abbey, who is... Uh, been here and, and worked at NASA for so long, it's a little intimidating to have to speak in front of George because anything I say, he'll know the micro thing I'm saying a little wrong, uh, but he'll indulge me because he's um, a great gentleman and a scholar and uh, has done about as much for NASA as anybody I can imagine over the decades. Uh, I thought I'd start by just mentioning, you know, this speech here, September 12th, we're talking about. That took place right across in the football stadium here. Um, there were, the uh, crowds are varied. Uh, some people say 30,000, some people say less, but 10,000 were Boy Scouts. It was uh, hot or hotter than it is right now. You'll see people on the video clips of Kennedy's speech just fanning themselves with sweat pouring out of them. I do not know how John F. Kennedy didn't sweat, but he isn't. Everybody else is soaked, and he, he isn't. And he came and gave, I call it, one of the great presidential addresses in American history. It is, without question, the best presidential speech on science. And not just science, scientific discovery and public discovery, which means why do all of us care about space? Kennedy said we're all on it. One thing he was exceptionally well at President Kennedy was telling people it'll cost you 50 cents a week. It'll cost you 50 a week. I need you. You know, that as they used to say at NASA, no bucks, no Buck Rogers. It's expensive. But he came right out and told people that out of the gate that it's going to have to be a big time national initiative and we're going to do it. And the speech soars, we call it, you know, we choose to go to the moon, not because uh, it's easy, but because it's hard. But he connects our astronauts to the tradition of exploration like Magellan and Columbus. He calls the, our solar system, the galaxies, the new ocean, the new sea. Um, and it's just a King Daddy speech. Uh, in fact, I would go so far um, to think it's the most important speech John F. Kennedy did, ever gave from the point of view of posterity. There are all these, uh, the inaugural address and a speech at American University, but the speech he gave 
here at Rice is evergreen because it touched the aspirations of people wanting to not just go to space, but why we explore and why we do things. And I am going to the Rice UT football game this Saturday, and I expect Rice to win. Um, I'm an optimist, and I have a lot of the students in my class, so I have to get behind it. Uh, what made Kennedy into such a big NASA uh, and space buff? Um, many ways you can say it begins with Sputnik when the Soviet Union puts that up in 1957. But also keep in mind, Kennedy was born in 1917 in Brookline, Massachusetts, which tells you it was the first generation born in the age of aviation, the age of flight. The Wright brothers are 1903 when they go to Kitty Hawk, you know, and it's, it, they barely can, they're using the wind to help them and they can barely, you know, get off of the beach. And certainly the Wright brothers are tied directly to Apollo 11 going to the moon. Our Apollo astronauts brought a piece of the Wright brothers plane with them to the moon. But then after 1903, President Woodrow Wilson started funding during World War I some federal money for military aviation out of Langley in Virginia. And really it was doing experiments on wind tunnels and how do you de-ice for airplanes and all. But Langley became a hub of that connection from aviation to space. Um, but so if you're born in 1917, the aviation, let's say John F. Kennedy's 10 years old in 1927, what's the big data? What happens in 1927? Lindbergh crosses the Atlantic. Young Jack Kennedy and his brothers are riveted. The Kennedy households riveted like all Americans were of this feat of aviation. And I look back and CBS radio in the 1920s would regularly put on uh, radio shows about space exploration, the moon. I mentioned the uh, Flash Gorn and Buck Rogers were kind of competing for um, Western gear as kids' toys. There were laser guns being sold and the like in the 1920s. And down the road from where Jack Kennedy was born in Brookline was America's pioneering rocketeer, Dr. Robert Goddard. And Goddard was um, really, when I say a pioneer, I mean it. He, you know, up until Goddard and a group of others in Europe, um, but the people thought of going into space kind of like a, a um, cannon fire. I mean, how do you put a projectile 62 miles straight up and break the grip of uh, the gravity grip of Earth to get into lower orbit? Nobody can do such a thing. It was a dream to do it. But if you could fly, if you can have airplanes and humans have never flown, maybe you can become space travelers. And Goddard came up with a lot of principles operating out of Clark University in Massachusetts, using liquid fuel propellants. He would put up these primitive rockets and in a cabbage field in Auburn, Massachusetts, get, basically get written up for noise making, disturbing the peace. Um, he finally had to move his rocket operation to a army base there, and he didn't like that because they were, they were trying to control his experiments. And he got hit hard by the New York Times, wrote a really uh, devastating negative story about Robert Goddard as being a bit of a quack, the crazy professor from Clark University. Uh, it stung, it stung Goddard deeply. No professor or scientist wants to be called fraudulent, nobody does. But it really, he was really pushing envelopes with, with how to operate in a vacuum and on and on and it dejected him. And then the Great Depression hit in 1929 and money dries up. The banks are foreclosing. You, know, you have the stock market crash. Houston is one of the only cities that didn't have bank foreclosures in the Great Depression. Um, you know, we, we were able to stay a little bit on, uh, on top of things down here due to the petroleum industry. But it devastated the country and Goddard could get no money. Charles Lindbergh raised a little bit of money for Goddard. And, um, and the Guggenheim Foundation gave him a grant. But basically he had to get out of Massachusetts. Nobody seemed to care about his rockets. And he moved to Roswell, New Mexico. 
Um, all of these people that tell you they're seeing space aliens and, uh, and the like, they weren't crazy. They were seeing some projectiles going up in the desert sky. It was still horse and cattle country in the late 1920s and early 1930s. And he continued his experiments on the Eden Valley Ranch. But he was it. Goddard's our number one rocketeer. Um, we weren't putting money into it. Franklin D. Roosevelt, who I once wrote, or I've, I've written about quite a lot, and is an amazing president, but he had a great blind spot to missiles and rockets. He thought it was futuristic nonsense. Uh, during World War II, we did not build under FDRA rocket and missile program. We did do the Manhattan Project for nuclear weapons and did it in an astounding fashion. Uh, and when one talks about Apollo 11, you can often say it's the Panama Canal or Manhattan Project, big project that works like that. Um, but uh, we neglected rockets in our country, by and large. And one country had other people of Goddard stature and even better, perhaps, and that was Germany. And uh, in the Weimar Republic, 1920s, Germany rocket and rocket clubs became a fetish. It became part of the German culture. When Adolf Hitler came to power in 1933, some of the Jewish rocket, uh, some of the rocketeers fled due to the Jewish, um, you know, um, discrimination and eventually Holocaust situation. But one of the German rocketeers who stayed, Dr. Werner von Braun. And von Braun, during World War II, built rockets for Hitler. He became an officer in the SS. And um, he was fighting for his homeland, Germany. Um, he built vengeance weapons for Hitler, the V1, V2, and V3. And the V2 caused a lot of harm on, the, on Great Britain. What basically von Braun was operating, he came like Kennedy from a, a kind of an aristocratic family. His father had been a baron and a minister of agriculture, um, Berlin Tech, technical school education. He was a wizard, um, very young at rocketry. But what they, working in secret off of his Baltic base, he was able to eventually get rockets, a rocket that could go into, into outer space and break that 62 miles. How do you put a projectile into space? Von Braun was the cutting edge on it. Um, but the V2s weren't meant for space travel or to put satellites up. They were meant to destroy London and Antwerp and other cities. And the Germans would move the V2s on uh, uh, movable launchers, and then they would shoot them out of like a leafy suburb of Den Haag or Rotterdam over the English Channel, and they would often land willy-nilly in greater London or they had no precision bombing back then. Uh, these early, uh, early missiles of Germany would go in all different directions, but thousands of people died to, due to the V-2. There's a deep and rich literature, a literature of fear of the V-2 that comes out of um, Great Britain. And if you go there today, museums talk about it. You can visit the Churchill underground uh, you know, uh, war room where they talk about you know, worries of the V-2. Um, but alas, these in innovation and in technology of these missiles came late in the war. As I mentioned, they did not have precision, but they were d d death weapons. If Hitler was going to beat the United States, it would have been the perfecting of these weapons. But alas, the Third Reich's after D-Day, the Third Reich starts going down. Alas, you have Battle of the Bulge, and alas, Adolf Hitler kills himself in a bunker. And von Braun and his rocket team are, the writing's clearly on the wall. The German government is collapsing, and they're going to be winners and losers in Germany. And von Braun does not want to be captured by the British army for fear of being charged with war crimes. Doesn't want to be captured by Russia, who would? You want to live in Stalin's Russia after World War or II? So his only bet's the United States. And in a very great, what I call technology heist, really, von Braun and 137 German rocketeers take all of their blueprints, equipment, material for missile technology and rockets, forge a document to get them on railroad cars, move the rail cars into the, into the mountains and bury all of it and blow up a cave entrance, 
hide out in a Bavarian Alps hostel, and Werner von Braun sends his younger brother on a Magnus von Braun on a bicycle to go surrender to the U.S. Army. He's from a, a guy from Sheboygan, a private, points a weapon on, on I mean, he said, my brother is the Werner von Braun. Everybody wanted von Braun and his technology, meaning uh, it was a great war prize to have that. And under Operation Paperclip, a deal is made, and Werner von Braun and 137 German rocketeers are able to come to the United States and operate out of El Paso, Texas, Fort Bliss, they're called POPs, prisoners of peace. And by 1950, they get moved to Huntsville, Alabama at the Redstone Arsenal. And there is nobody that has the engineering know-how and also the salesmanship of Werner von Braun. We did not sanitize his record, but we accepted him in the United States in a sense. Uh, uh, and, and yet some people still today charge war crimes for what he did working with the Third Reich. Um, one person who didn't charge him of anything was John F. Kennedy. Kennedy lost his brother in World War II in a death on Operation Aphrodite, trying to pack airplanes filled with a Navy aviator, filled with dynamite or tour packs, and Joe Kennedy uh, Jr. Would f was supposed to fly and then go into these sort of Nazi cave system in France. It's like a, a drone and it was highly risky and he blew up. And eventually the plane evaporated. There was that much of an explosion. And the, the young John F. Kennedy became a war hero, but in death. And um, Joe Kennedy, a war hero in death. John F. Kennedy became a war hero with the PT-109 incident in the Pacific. Um, but cut to 1953. Young John F. Kennedy gets elected to the U.S. Senate in 1952. I need you to all know one thing about John F. Kennedy. I know you have a vision of him and we're talking about a speech here at Rice. Kennedy doesn't like losing. Now you might say, well, who likes losing? I mean, he really didn't like losing. He never lost an election. He ran for Congress in 1946 and won. He ran in 1948 and won. He ran in 1950 and won. He ran for the Senate in 1952 and won. He ran for the Senate in 58 and won. He ran for the presidency in 60 and won. And then of course he was killed in Dallas on November 22nd, 1963. His father, Joe Kennedy Sr., instilled in the boys winning. And in fact, there's a wonderful um, Stephen's story about Kennedy playing chess and he's about to be checkmated and he goes, whoops, and pushes the whole chess set over and says, I guess we'll never know who won. Um, so he's wired and he wants to win the Cold War. He does not like Russia and Russia has a missile program that we're just learning how sophisticated it is. They got German technology. We've had the atomic bomb, the only time in world history a country with a nuclear monopoly, the United States, 1945 to 1949. But then the Soviets have, get the A-bomb, then the hydrogen bomb. They put up the R-7, the first intercontinental ballistic missile ever. And they are tracking with Stalin's pumping money into uh, technology and missiles. And if you cut to 1953, we know we're lagging behind in some missile technology. We're worried about Russia. We win the Korean War on military aviation. And astronauts you all celebrate were pilots, Neil Armstrong and John Glenn and Wally Shira in the Korean War. But we didn't do missiles in the Korean War. And um, Kennedy, when I picked 53, because he got chosen by Time Magazine to be one of the judges of Time's Person of the Year, and the other judge was Werner Von Braun. Von Braun had been on television on Walt Disney's show as the great futurist, and the first thing Von Braun did when he made to America is he talked about moon and Mars exploration. His first talk was to the El Paso Rotary Club and it's moon, Mars, and, and got the country excited about it. Now you might say, well, why would we embrace in a former Nazi? Well, 1953, we were embracing a lot of Germans. We, West Germany was our great new ally, and Japan was our new best friend, and, and Europe were doing NATO. 
And Kennedy saw it as von Braun was German, he fought for Germany, I'm an American, I fought for America, that's what happens. And he didn't hold it against him. But they became friendly, and in 1957, the Soviets put Sputnik up, and guess who's livid about it? A lot of people, it's beep, 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 going around, and many people panic, my gosh, now they beat us in satellite technology, Russia. And, um, and everybody blamed, or people who wanted to, blame Dwight Eisenhower. The truth was, at the time of Sputnik, we were not behind in satellites. We were not behind in technology. There was great parity, and perhaps we even were superseding Russia. But the Russians' sp hurry up approach, being the first, being the first, the newspaper headlines were startling with Sputnik. And John F. Kennedy decides to score political points on it. He's eyeing the presidency in 1960, and he starts accusing Eisenhower of being asleep at the wheel, saying he invents the term missile gap. There's a missile gap with the Soviet Union. If you look up in the Oxford Dictionary, you'll see Kennedy invented the term missile gap and space lag. And we've got to do something. And he's saying Eisenhower's not doing enough, and Lyndon Johnson's doing the same. But Lyndon Johnson plays a big role in the creation of NASA in 1958. And one of the amazing things about NASA is we create it for civilian exploration of space, not for military reasons, that we want to learn knowledge of our solar system. And um, Kennedy and Johnson, each are NASA enthusiasts. One of the two is gonna be the nomination for president in 1960. It becomes John Kennedy. He beats Johnson out for that, but both had scored points on beating up on Eisenhower. In fact, the great debates of 1960, Kennedy versus Nixon, Vice President Richard Nixon, everybody says those were the first televised debates. They were the first presidential debates, period. We don't do presidential debates in the United States pre-1960. Lincoln Douglas was about Illinois. Um, so four debates in the fall of 1960 between Kennedy and Nixon, uh, it's almost a cliche to say, but people watching on television said Kennedy won. People on radio thought Nixon won. You would be amazed of going back and listening to them all like I did about the civility back then between the two. But Kennedy scores two punches on Nixon. You can feel him getting debate points. At one point he says to, you know, Nixon's in a box because he can't criticize Eisenhower or his boss. And uh, at one point Kennedy says, I, if you're elected president of the United States, I see a Soviet flag planted on the moon. I want to see an American flag on the moon. Good. <laughs> and at another moment, Kennedy says in it, you told Mr. Khrushchev that America's number one in kitchen appliances and that we have color television. I'll take my television in black and white. I want to be number one in rocket thrust. Another kind of point. So Kennedy's committed by the time he wins in 1960. In fact, the term new frontier that Kennedy uses as the rubric for all of his administration you know, we, everybody, they, at the back then you had to have a slogan like that, like the New Deal of FDR, or the Fair Deal of Truman, the New Look of Eisenhower, the New Frontier. The term New Frontier is used in NASA literature all the time in 59 and 60. I found it in brochures, pamphlets, promotions, the New Frontier. Kennedy never really said what he was going to do and whether we were going to the moon yet or not, but his famous inaugural address Shortly after he becomes president, the Soviets put up Yuri Gagarin, the first human in space. And it's a Russian cosmonaut, and it happens on Jack Kennedy's watch, not Eisenhower. And Kennedy's livid. And one White House meeting, he's screaming, tell me how to leapfrog the Russians. I want to leapfrog them. That's his big word. I found he wrote the, that to a young kid who wrote him about space and can we beat Russia and Kennedy in the 50s said we want to leapfrog. And the leap, and Kennedy said, I don't care if it's the janitor over there, who can tell me how to leapfrog them? And the answer is Werner von Braun had, let's go to the moon. Lyndon Johnson had it, let's go to the moon. James Webb, the extraordinary NASA administrator, 
got on board, we're gonna go to the moon. And then, but before you go to the moon, Kennedy Greenland, Alan Shepard, amazing astronaut from New Hampshire whose ancestors were on the Mayflower and Shepard's Greenland as a counter statement to Yuri Gagarin. It's risky because we're not sure of the technology. We had a lot of rockets, vanguards, not von Braun rockets, but vanguards crumble, the Navy rockets in the 50s. Alan Shepard goes up 15 minutes, comes down 15 minutes, and he's a national hero. And Kennedy's thinking, I like these space guys. I'm, they're like Kennedy space cadets. <laughs> you know, he created the US SEALs, Kennedy, as an amphibious force, and he created the Green Beret. He was in PT-109. And when he talked to Werner von Braun as being one of the judges, they met in New York in 53, Kennedy ate up a lot of his talk talking about ballistic missiles and how his brother died trying to take out Werner von Braun's weaponry. And once Alan Shepard goes up that very month, May of 1961, John F. Kennedy goes to do an extraordinary joint session of Congress and says, we're gonna put a man to the moon by the end of the decade and bring him back alive. Wow. Uh, as the little film Steve just showed us point out, and no, everybody said, what? Everybody at NASA is like, there is no technology to go to the moon. Wait, is, he, is he on glue? Is he crazy? I mean, what is he doing? And in fact, John F. Kennedy's own father called the White House and got, um, they're trying to reach him and uh, the secretary, I believe it was Evelyn Lincoln, trying to get the call, find it in, in uh, Kennedy's, JFK's father's like, God damn it, I knew Jack would do something crazy like this. <laughs> that reckless streak in him, you know. Um, but it pulled the country together. Uh, the space hardware people met in your state, Jim, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, on May 26, a day after Kennedy's moon pledge, and all these companies out of Oklahoma with Senator Kerr there and others started putting in bids for what will become the Apollo program and designs and all the money that'll be involved. Kennedy was able to justify what today would be, you know, $27 billion then, about $180 billion today. We're going to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. The Apollo program's up and running. But for young people here, people not following space as much as our dignitaries in the front, Mercury's one astronaut, Gemini two, Apollo three astronauts, the goal of the moon. And it's expensive and we pay for it. I will, in my limited time here, just tell you we had six Mercury missions under Jack Kennedy, all were successful. Uh, Gus Grissom, loss of capsule and things, but by and large, they're all successful Mercury missions. Kennedy's basking in the glow of that Mercury. TV's a big deal. People are leaning forward and watching these. Even now when you know the outcome, if you watch John Glenn going into space in early 60, 1962, orbiting the Earth five times and his heat shield gets loose and we, oh, Earth loses contact with John Glenn and we're making the, the assumption he probably died and then suddenly radio contact and he's coming back to splash down and Glenn becomes the, the Charles Lindbergh of the moment. Um, Glenn is, becomes Kennedy's favorite of the astronauts. He's the Marine astronaut. And in fact, his brother Bobby Kennedy and Ethel Kennedy became very close to John Glenn. I talked to Ethel Kennedy, Robert Kennedy's widow, and she told me that when her husband, when Sir Han, Sir Han was, killed her husband, she left to call John Glenn in La well, she was in, and to tell him to go to Hickory Hill and look after her kids because he was so calm and had such a calming way with her, her children. That's how close the Kennedys got involved with John Glenn, who later becomes a senator from Ohio. Um, but one of the things, and we're gonna do space medicine here at Rice soon in a conference. One of the things Kennedy does really well, in a spe he goes to Huntsville, he goes to Cape Canaveral, he meets with Werner von Braun, space age is upon us. Um, the Space Needle at the World's Fair in Seattle, 1962, with all the astronauts going. Kennedy starts planning with the World's Fair in New York in 1964 with all these space-themed, you know, including capsules and all from NASA there. 
uh, aerospace designs like airport terminals. And here in Houston, if you look at a phone book in Houston, 1960, you won't see things about space. By 1963, it's like astro babysitters, you know, space, the space, all night space diner and space themed things because the Kennedy gave a lot of money here to Houston, Texas. This was the winning city on the bids for the Manned Space Center. Um, uh, Massachusetts was in the mix. All these cities put in bids. One reason it came here was because Senator or Congressman Albert Thomas of Houston, who has deep rice history, Albert Thomas um, was the head of space, congressional space appropriations. And, uh, and that was one of the, uh, and Lyndon Johnson being from here. And also guys, Kennedy barely won Texas in 1960. Hard to believe Democrat won in 60 when you think of today, but he won Kennedy, Texas by hair. So smart politics for reelection in 64 to pump some money into tech corridors down here and boy did it explode go out to clear lake city and you'll see you know every company boeing or north american aviation mcdonald douglas you know i mean just campuses for makes houston an aerospace center john f kennedy right before he died the day before he died went to san antonio texas at brooks air force base and at brooks he said about going to the moon and space we threw our cap over the wall and now we gotta climb the wall to go get it. Meaning we're committed and we gotta find a way to do it with engineering and computer technology. Here in Texas, Texas Instruments, Jack Kirby had helped perfect transistor um, computer chips. If you go to 1960, there are no computer science classes offered degrees in America by 63. Universities are offering computer science degrees. So the technology is meeting the times and Kennedy's there to seize it. But I was amazed the day before he died a speech he gave in San Antonio where he started itemizing the spin-off technology of why the money's worth it for heart defibrillators and MRI and CAT scan and foam cushion for football players and firefighting resistance suits and all of the space medicine spin-off technology is unbelievable. And of course, we also get things like GPS out of it and a whole, it, NASA was the great incubator for testing out new technology in the 60s. It goes NASA to the Silicon Valley and beyond. But also the Apollo program, guys, was the last great act of World War II. By that I mean we were still in a hurry up mode, that high risk, People died in, the, in, in, in test pilots and the like, trying to get to the moon. Um, there weren't a lot of safe guardrails. It was still more like a World War II environment. Many of the chief engineers had served in the World War II. James Webb, a NASA administrator, was a Marine in World War II and was overseeing radar in the Pacific. I mean, that generation, the greatest generation, has a lot to do in going to the moon, even though the astronauts are younger. Uh, they're Kennedys, and we're in the Kennedy generation group. Um, after San Antonio, Kennedy came here to Houston. He'd always stay at the old Rice Hotel downtown, and he spoke to Albert Thomas, and he made a, a, a slip, uh, a gaffe, in, in, uh, where Kennedy suddenly said, you know, here in Houston, we're putting the biggest payroll in your, and he said, I mean, the payload in space. And everybody applauded. And one of the letters I found from George Herbert Walker Bush, head of Harris County Republicans, said when Jack Kennedy and Jackie come to town, all Republicans need to honor him and salute him. Uh, we don't want to protest because of what he did to help the business economy of the city of Houston. It's a letter from Bush 41 back then. Um, from Houston, he goes to Fort Worth, Dallas, you know what happens. You may not know, Kennedy was on his way to give a speech at the trademark about space and about how many satellites we put up, telecommunication satellites, weather reconnaissance satellites, how we were, we're beating the Soviets or we're near beating them and we're doing it. And he had all the stats of how much his administration did. It would have been a powerful speech he didn't get to do. Of course, after he's dead, he's buried in Arlington Cemetery. And I found a letter that Jackie 
Um, Kennedy starts writing Werner von Braun about keeping Jack's dream alive. Von Braun now is building Fort Kennedy, the Saturn rocket, including the Saturn V that takes Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins into space in 1969. But Jackie Kennedy also goes and meets Lyndon and Lady Bird Johnson in the White House, and she tell, asks them to keep Jack's dream alive of the moon. And Johnson says, we will. And in fact, the first thing Johnson said we're going to do to memorialize Kennedy is call it the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. In the 60s, there's constant pressure to defund NASA or defund Apollo. Um, you know, we were spending 4.4% of our annual budget on the moon. Today, it's, uh, Jim would know better than me, but I think like a third of 1% or something. Less than half, yeah. Um, and so, you know, uh, but keep that in mind. You know, we've got to fund NASA. And I'm a, I think NASA's an amazing, amazing um, leader. And I just love the agency because they, they grabbed my attention when I was a kid. And I, they've never, I've never let go of NASA. But in the 60s, and it wasn't left, people on the left wanted to defund going to the moon. People like William Fulbright, Senator Arkansas, said let's put the money into education. Walter Mondale wanted to put it into urban renewal. Barry Goldwater, conservative of Arizona, wanted the money to go into the Air Force. Um, you know, there are dissenters on both sides of the aisle, but the bipartisan spirit to fulfill Kennedy's pledge existed. Apollo 1 disaster in 1967 almost killed that effort. That's the horrible moment when Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chafee blew up on the launch pad. And, you know, people were saying, why do we got to go to the moon by the end of the decade? Are we taking too many shortcuts? Um, but Apollo still had enough gas in its tank. And Richard Nixon became president. And Nixon is the on the president of record that got to embrace and have that great moment when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin finally went to the moon. We dreamed about going to the moon forever, um, and we did it. And uh, it's one of my, the great things I'm thrilled about our country made it to the moon. It controls the moon, our tides, our calendar. It's just part of human life. And the thought that, and I grew up in Ohio, the thought that Neil Armstrong down the road from me was the first human being on, on the moon was a thrill for me growing up. And, um, you know, they, when the, Nixon did all the appropriate things throughout that. We picked the astronauts up, uh, Armstrong and Collins and, um, and Aldrin. And they're at NASA, Mission Control, here in Houston, and on the giant screen, I'm across this on a big thing. Once we retrieve them, and they're on the Hornet, we put up a NASA John F. Kennedy's pledge of, um, you know, of going to the moon, May 25th, 1961, and then underneath the pledge, it said, mission accomplished July 1969. And uh, that same day, somebody put a bouquet of flowers on John F. Kennedy's grave with a little note card that said, Mr. President, the eagle has landed. And um, Kennedy now, and part of his presidential legacy, will ever be synonymous with space and the, and the idea of you, we can do it. Um, and NASA has had many other historic achievements. I will tell you though, the difference between some of the people that work in NASA and a humanities professor like me, is I got to, due to George Abbey, interview Neil Armstrong back in 19, 2001. And, and um, George um, helped me have that opportunity. And at one point I asked Mr. Armstrong, who graduated from Purdue, was an engineer, great combat pilot in Korea, extraordinary combat pilot. Uh, you can't exaggerate how good he was. Uh, but he's a science guy, didn't like the media, and kind of worked straight ahead, Neil Armstrong. And I felt uh, making a little progress with him. We, we were getting along. And finally, I, I, I said, Mr. Armstrong, do you ever just go out, like on the days leading up to Apollo 11, and look at the moon, and you see it like luminous, and you think, my God, gosh, I'm going to be standing there soon, looking down on earth. And he said, no. <laughs> <laughs>
The point is, he wasn't wired that way. And the point is, I don't know what, how to put a rocket into space. I'm a history professor. But I sure do know an incredible moment in American history, and I recognize the teamwork of NASA in the 60s and beyond. And later today, tonight, we're gonna get to hear a little bit about the Artemis program, which I'm really excited about, the idea of Americans returning to the moon, We've had 12 American moonwalkers, and they were all men. It's time to have women on the moon. And, and, we, we, and, and there's ice on the caps of the moon, and it's worth exploring, and it could be a very great springboard to Mars. But as you all know, once you're a, a buff of NASA and of the space program, I find some of the most exceptional people I've gotten to know work for NASA. They're quite remarkable and they always make me proud just like people in our armed forces do about the work they do for the United States but also for uh, space exploration and the realm of space science. Thank you. So thank you for that. We, we do have uh, time for maybe one or two quick questions if you'd like to come up to the microphones. Doug will also be on the panel, so you can ask him then. Um, while you're thinking about that uh, and getting over your fears, I hope Doug will forgive me for this, but um, the, when Rice had the centenary, which wasn't all that long ago, um, there was a nice video that was put together by our public affairs, and, and, and uh, Douglas was a big part of that video. And he said something that I'm really envious of, and I wish I had said it, which was that... Um, I, I would make correct a little bit of your astronomy, but I won't do that tonight. Um, <laughs> you know, something like three or four thousand years from now, when we are living on planets throughout the solar system, they're going to ask, how did we get there? And they're going to look back to that speech at Rice Stadium in 1962. And that was just such a great way of talking about the impact of that speech and the, the future thinking of it and how we're all living up to that, uh, that kind of uh, vision. So, um, like I said, he's a very good writer. He's a very good speaker. Mm -hmm. um, are there any questions that, that you have for him right now? Is, there, so is this you coming up to the mic, Helen? Thank you. I'm a, a visitor to Houston and I've met extraordinary people already. I wonder if Kennedy was alive today, right now, with this new program, what do you think you might say about Artemis and what's about to happen? You know, I don't do what if history because I can't put words in people's mouths that, I'm not, that aren't here, but I can quite assuredly tell you John F. Kennedy became really bullish on space exploration and he, I believe, would have been a course about exploring and going to the moon and, um, and they would be very excited about a program like the Artemis and probably would have been a progenitor of a program like that because he had that sense of adventure um, that sense that, that, um, that America had to be supreme in the realm of space exploration. I don't have time to talk about Kennedy wanting to, can we work with other countries? And that's a whole other talk. Uh, there was one moment where they thought, Kennedy thought about, may, could we go to the moon with Russia? And of course that doesn't happen, but the great line comes from um, Nikita Khrushchev's son, Sergei Khrushchev, and Sergei said, was like, Dad, why can't we go to the moon with the United States? What if we do it together? And she said, no, we can't let the, then the, if we go work with and cooperate like that, then the Americans will know what we don't have. <laughs> Meaning the bluffing aspect of what they had, they would start seeing the shortcomings of their program. But, you know, that idea of, of nation sharing appealed to Kennedy too, not just American exceptionalism. We might go to Mars with China or the European Union or who knows who. Yes. Yeah, I was wondering if, in your opinion, would the American people and the politicians in Washington would have had the, the will to keep going and fund NASA and make it in 1969, before the end of the decade, if President had been killed? That's an interesting question. Some people feel that it, can, we got to the moon on the Kennedy murder syndrome in the sense that his assassination made us feel we should fulfill the pledge. But um, 
It, it's already pretty baked in, guys, meaning these companies already got big contracts. You wouldn't want to go running for president in 64 if you're Kennedy and start pulling the plug out of companies that have already invested, you know, uh, hundreds of million dollars into, uh, into uh, equipment. And now you're starting to say, forget it. I didn't really mean it and all. So I'm sure Kennedy would have stuck with it in 64, in my opinion. And the question is, if he got reelected, would there be a bipartisan appetite for it? The reason, guys, the Cold War presented a unique opportunity, because Kennedy had the Democrats. He needed Republicans to join him. And all he had to say to a Republican was, oh, so you want Russia to go to the moon before us? I didn't say that, Mr. President. I'm not, you know. So, you know, in the sense of patriotism, it was pretty, he had a pretty set group of people wanting to, to do it. And it was a race to the moon. We now know Russia was trying to get there till the very last minute. And one of the neat things, guys, on the moon, we all know the one small step for a man line and you know, all that. But right, there's a moment when they're about to leave. You can hear Armstrong say to Aldrin, did you leave the packet? And something's left there but you don't know what it is at the time. In that packet were medals honoring, cast commemorative medals to honoring the Apollo 1 astronauts that blew up, G White, Grissom, and Chafee, and we cast medals to honor the Soviet cosmonauts who died in their space program. There's a medal on that moon spot where Yuri get for honoring Yuri Gagarin, because without Russia, without that competition, short, we didn't want to go to war, but we competed in the realm of science. Everybody in NASA understood that these Russian cosmonauts were they were keeping us going. We were burning the midnight oil because we had competition. Yes, sir. Well, I think. Sorry, can I? Can you be the first question on our panel? Because okay. we have a very, right. we have a very rich. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Thank you, guys.